So the spine of the scapula has four borders and two surfaces. The posterior border of this spine, the posterior border of this spine is called the crest of the spine. The posterior border of this spine is called the what? The crest of the spine. This is the posterior border of this spine. So it is called the crest of the spine. This crest of the spine, which is the posterior border, has two leaves. It has the lower lip. This is the lower lip. And it has the upper lip. This is the upper lip of this crest of the spine. So now let's talk about the muscle that is arising from the crest of the spine of the scapula. There are about two important muscles arising from the crest of the spine of the scapula. One is called as the trapezius and the other one is called as one is called as trapezius and the other one is called as a deltoid muscle. So the trapezius is going to get attachment at the upper border of the spine throughout the whole course of the upper lip of the spine. So the trapezius is going to get attached like this at the upper border throughout till the acromion process, even the upper border of the acromion process, that is how the trapezius muscle is going to get attached. Next is the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle is going to get origin from the inferior angle. The inferior lip of the crest of this one is where the deltoid muscle is going to get origin from. And it will now go and get inserted on the deltoid tuberosity that is present in the humerus. So this is basically the muscle that is originating from the spine of the scapula. Now let us talk about the surfaces. We say the scapula has two surfaces. Scapula has two surfaces. You have anterior surface or the subscapula surface. And then we also have said it has the dorsal or posterior surface. So let's see the muscle that is arising from the surface of the scapula. First, let's see the anterior surface. Muscle arising from the anterior surface. Right, the anterior surface has three ridge. Right, this ridge is used to help for the attachment of muscle. And the muscle that is arising from this anterior surface is called as the subscapularis, which is part of the rotator cuff muscle present in the shoulder. It helps to stabilize the shoulder and helps the shoulder to rotate properly. So the subscapularis gets origin from the anterior surface of the scapula, dorsal surface. The dorsal surface is being divided by the spinous process into upper smaller part and lower larger part. The upper smaller part is where the supraspinatus muscle is going to get origin. So this point here is where supraspinatus gets origin from. The lower part, the lower larger part is where the infraspinatus muscle gets origin from. Infraspinatus get origin from lower part while the upper part, the supraspinatus muscle gets origin from. So at the dorsal surface, supraspinatus, infraspinatus originating. At the anterior surface is what? The subscapularis muscle getting origin. So this is basically the muscles that is originating from the anterior as well as dorsal surface. Now let us see the capsule originating from the scapula. The capsule originating from the scapula is usually the capsule, the fibrous capsule of the joint, shoulder joint. It's going to get origin from the margin of the glenoid cavity as well as the labrum, the glenoidal labrum that is present in the glenoid cavity. This glenoidal labrum helps to deepen the fossa because if the glenoidal labrum is not present in the glenoid cavity, the fossa is going to be shallow and then proper movement of the head of the human is not going to be really possible. So 
The presence of the labor now is going to help deepen this fossa so that the head of the humerus can now do what can now penetrate inside during cause of rotation or movement. So the glenoid labrum helps what deepen the fossa while the capsule is being attached at the margin, this corner here of this cavity. So that is basically the where the capsule is going to get origin from. It's going to attach right here. So after knowing the capsule as well as the muscle that is arising from the scapula, finally let's talk about the ossification of the scapula. The ossification of the scapula is how the scapula develops in the during intra uterine life. During intra uterine life. How does the scapula develop? Now the scapula develops from primary center as well as the uh, secondary center. Now this primary center is about one in the scapula. Let me show you an example here. Primary center is about one in the scapula. The primary center of the scapula is usually located where? At the body of the scapula, the middle part. That's where the primary center is located. And then the scapula has what? Secondary center, which is about seven. So it has one primary center and what? Seven secondary center. One primary center and seven secondary center. The second secondary center has two. Two is originating from the acromion process. Two is originating from the acromion process. Acromion process. Coracoid process is also given out to coracoid process of the scapula. That is this point that is protruding out. There is a small point protruding out after the suprascapular noise. This point is called as the coracoid process. So the coracoid process has two secondary ossification. The lateral border, lateral border has one. Ossification. Media border has one ossification. Media border has one ossification. One secondary ossification and the spine of the scapula also has secondary ossification. So that is basically how the scapula gets ossification. But this primary center is usually the first point in the scapula to get ossified right so this primary center ossify as during the week of during its week of intra uterine life so the primary center develop during its week of intra uterine life the secondary center is going to develop after when the primary center has ossified but this secondary center usually develop from 15, 16 to 25th year. Secondary center develop from 15, 16 to 25th years. In basically, it develops at 28 years. But the primary center develops at all 8 week. So that is basically the development or the ossification of the scapula. Next is the clinical notes. Clinical anatomy of the scapula. The scapula can be damaged by nerve. If the nerve is damaged, especially the nerve that is supplying the muscle around the scapula region, if this nerve is damaged now, it's going to cause paralysis of this muscle because the nerve is the one that is that is what 
acting for the function of this muzzle. So now, if this nerve is now damaged, it will cause a condition to the scapula because this muzzle will become paralyzed, they will be weak, they cannot perform the action again. So one of these damage is usually happen at the long thoracic nerve. The long thoracic nerve is a nerve that supplies the largissimum docile muzzle. And this largissimum docile muzzle is present at the inferior angle. It's going to hold the scapula in place. So if this long thoracic nerve is damaged, now it's going to cause weakness of the... Sorry, it's not largissimum docile. It's the serratus anterior muzzle. Not largissimum docile. Largissimum docile is supplied by thoracodosal nerve. The long thoracic nerve is supplied by serratus anterior. So this serratus anterior that is attached to the medial border now is being supplied by long thoracic nerve. If the long thoracic nerve is damaged, then it's going to cause weakness to the serratus anterior. And the serratus anterior muscle cannot hold this scapula in place to the thoracic region again, thereby causing what? Winging of scapula. Winging of scapula. So that's one clinical anatomy of the scapula. Another clinical anatomy of the scapula is what is called as a scaphoid scapula. Scaphoid scapula. Scaphoid scapula is usually an abnormality, an abnormality or ab abnormality that occurs it's usually an abnormality that occurs it means the media border of the scapula to be concave it means the media border of the scapula to be concave but apart from this damage other other defects or inflammation can also occur in the scapula during intrauterine life during intrauterine development. During this intrauterine development, the scapula is usually formed at what the cervical region. So this scapula is formed at the cervical region. Scapula is usually formed at the cervical region. And let's say this is the cervical region and then this is the thoracic region now during intrauterine life the scapula is first going to be formed around this area so once it is formed there the scapula then is going to migrate down as the week is going back during ninth after each week of ossification during ninth to twelfth week the scapula is supposed to migrate downward or migrate quarterly to a point to its normal position at the thoracic region where it stays. So during this 9 to 12 week of migration, if there is any defects at the cervical region or any defects to the scapula at that region, the scapula might not be able to migrate downward. It might not be able to migrate to its normal position. In most cases, one of the scapula is going to migrate towards its normal position and the other one may not. So in this condition, it's usually referred to as a congenital cervical abnormalities. Congenital cervical abnormalities. So cervical abnormalities. Example of this congenital cervical abnormality is called the Clepi Fell syndrome. So one of these syndrome is called as the sprangel deformity. So sprangel deformity is the one that the scapula, one of them will be at the cervical region and the other will migrate towards the normal position. You see the person having a curved body. So that is a condition that occurs. 